Uh, we are so uh, thrilled and honored to welcome our featured speaker today, Margaret Downey. Uh, she got in touch with me back in November. Uh, she was invited to, uh, to be a part of a non-theist leadership summit here in Houston. And when she found out she was coming down here, she asked if she could speak here. And um, I know, it's like, that's like such an honor. Like, I didn't have to ask her, she asked me. That's really cool. <laughs> so, uh, so we're just thrilled. Uh, uh, Morgan and I have been great friends, and uh, so on a personal level, I'm just thrilled to have her here today. Um, she has studied the life and work of uh, founding father Thomas Paine for decades, and in just four days, she will be celebrating his birth date with other Thomas Paine enthusiasts in Southern California. Um, why didn't you do it where Thomas Paine actually lived? What, that, I mean, yeah. It's beautiful, yeah, go where it's beautiful, right? Okay. Um, she usually dresses in colonial costume when she delivers her presentation, but today you will just have to use your imagination as she transports you back in time to honor the life and work of this great patriot. Oh, and by the way, we were supposed to bring in the elementary school age kids during the coffee break. Is anyone, is Jason or someone? I mean, oh, here they come. Any, so youngsters that think they might be able to do this, or welcome to come sit up front. Oh, they're going to get them. Are you okay with that, Margaret? We'll just, yeah, okay. So, um, uh, Margaret has presented Thomas Paine assemblies at six elementary schools and at three national non-theist conferences. So this should be great. Let's give a warm Houston Oasis welcome to Margaret Downey. Well, I really wanted the children to be here. Should I wait just a few more minutes and maybe talk about uh, you and me, how we met? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> the kids have run away. Someone's stolen our kids. Uh, but Mike and I um, go way back, and uh, we found out that um, we had a lot in common with our interest in secular celebrations. And after he uh, graduated from the clergy project, I got in touch with him. And we are business partners, actually, because what I offered him was um, a place at my website, secularcelebrations.com, uh, business cards, uh, format for billing. So he was instantly set up as a, as a business partner. And I'm offering that to other clergy project um, graduates who um, can make a living out of getting uh, paid for doing weddings and funerals and other secular celebrations. So here are the youngsters. Oh, I'm so happy to see. You wanna sit up front? Okay. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my PowerPoint assistant is a new person to the Oasis. This is her first day here, and I recruited her. <laughs> her name is Dani Maldonado, and I'm very pleased to have met you, and thank you for volunteering. I'm so happy to be here uh, talking about my favorite founding father, Thomas Paine. Now, this presentation is very family friendly, and as you know, I asked children to be in the audience today because I've conducted um, elementary school assembles, uh, assemblies around the country talking about Thomas Paine's life and work. And while I can go on for hours and hours about the exciting life of Thomas Paine and his many accomplishments, I only have about uh, 25, 30 minutes to spark your interest in learning more about this great patriot. Now, it's fitting to be talking about Thomas Paine today because um, today, uh, well, today is about four days before he was actually born. Um, he was born on January 29th, uh, 1937 in Thetford, England. Thomas Paine was uh, born into a very religious Quaker family, but his mother was actually a member of the Anglican Church of England. Now, his family's religion believed that a child should be very quiet and agreeable. And his family believed that singing and dancing were sinful activities. And Thomas was very different from his family and most of the people in the village. He loved to be outside and he loved to dance. And one of his favorite activities was to sing with the birds in the garden. While he was walking in his garden, Tom was inspired to write his first poem. He found a dead crow lying on the gravel one day, which saddened him very much. 
And Thomas was only eight years old when he wrote a poem. And I'd like to recruit a young man in the audience to read the poem for us. I see someone right there at the end. Yeah? <laughs> What's your name? Conrad. Okay, and how old are you? Thirteen. Aha, uh -huh. well Tom Payne was only eight when he uh, wrote this poem. Yet I can't write a sonnet. <laughs> Here lies the body of, of John Crow, who once was high, but now is low. Ye brother crows, take warning all, for as ye rise, so must you fall. Thank you, Connor. A little gift for you. You can keep the poem. So when Thomas Paine was growing up, there was no such thing as television, radio, computers, or the internet. Thomas would spend hours and hours observing nature, singing, dancing, writing, and even as a child, Thomas refused to go along with those Quaker rules. He was always asking a lot of questions, and he questioned why the religion of his family advocated stopping a child from having fun and enjoying life. When Thomas was a teenager, he wanted some adventure. One morning, at the age of 17, he left a note for his parents that he was gonna go to work on a pirate ship. He traveled 30 miles to enlist on a ship a very famous pirate ship. The ship was named the Terrible, and the commander of the ship was known as Captain Death. <laughs> now just before the ship was set to sail, Thomas's father arrived at the dock, and he convinced Thomas to stay at home, which was a really good thing. <coughs> Within a few days, many pirates on the ship were killed at a battle in the sea. And that was the voyage that Thomas Paine would have been on. Now this was the first time that Thomas Paine escaped death. And there will be many more death inc instances that will occur throughout his life. And I'm going to tell you about most of those close calls in this presentation. Thomas was still hungry for adventure, so two years later he became a sailor on a merchant ship called the King of Prussia. After only one year, Thomas decided he didn't like the adventure of being on a ship. The ocean waves made him terribly sick. Now, he was 19 at the time, and when he returned home, he started working with his father. They made giant sails for ships and corsets for women. Thomas didn't like that job either, so he studied other things in his spare time. And during his early 20s, Thomas learned everything he could about math, history, science, and philosophy. He loved learning and reading so much that he moved closer to England, to, to London, England, in order to um, attend the Science Academy there to do self-study. In London, he met a beautiful young woman named Mary Lampert. Tom and Mary, they married right away. Love at first sight. They opened a store in Kent, England. And together, Mary and Thomas made sails, and again, women's corsets, just as he had learned from working with his father in Thetford, England. And they were very happy, but only for about a year. And then something awful happened. Mary died in childbirth, so the baby also died. You see, back then, women had difficulty when they were expecting a baby. Many women died during pregnancy or delivering a baby back in the 1700s. When Mary had difficulty giving birth, the London doctors didn't know how to save her life. But things are different now, and women are better cared for thanks to modern medicine, scientific advances, and m much better medications. Praise science. <laughs> Now today, thanks to science and research, we've learned how to take better care of women and babies who were born ill. But poor Thomas, he was so devastated after the death of his beautiful wife that he moved. He, was, he also changed his job. Uh, Thomas became a tax collector for the King of England. And the job was called 
excise officer. <coughs> you see, Mary's father was also an excise officer. <coughs> to honor Thomas Paine, this plaque you see on the screen was placed on the London building where Thomas worked as an excise officer. The title of excise officer were given to men who visited business places to collect taxes for the king. Now remember when I told you that Thomas Paine always asked a lot of questions? And he always questioned authority. He even questioned the authority of the King of England. Everybody knew that Thomas Paine was a great speaker and he always was declared the winner of any debate. And he debated people often. But well, after a while, Thomas Paine saw a big problem with the job as tax collector. None of the tax collectors were paid enough, and some coll tax collectors became dishonest just to survive. So Thomas decided that he needed to talk to the King of England about this situation. And the other tax collectors said, oh yes, yes, go to London, speak to the king on our behalf, speak to the parliament on our behalf. And with this responsibility, Thomas Paine became the very first trade union spokesperson. The day that Thomas spoke to the parliament, a very famous person from the American colonies heard him, and that was Benjamin Franklin. Mr. Franklin befriended uh, bef befriended Thomas because he was, a, he was very, very impressed with the way that Thomas Paine spoke to the parliament and presented the arguments about the excise men's p wages and difficulties. And Mr. Franklin felt that Thomas would be a very valuable man to have on the side of the new American colonies because something was brewing. Mr. Franklin knew that the colonists would soon be going to war with England. So he convinced Thomas Paine to travel to America to start a whole new life. Thomas Paine was almost 40 years old. Thomas agreed to go to America because he had to find this new job. And by the time he was, he was around 37 is when all this happened. And he traveled um, because he was convinced to leave England. And quite frankly, the king and the parliament had just fired him for being so bold to complain about being an excise man. <laughs> the very same day that Thomas Paine spoke to the parliament, he was fired from that job. So the first job Thomas Paine got when he arrived to America was writing for the Pennsylvania Magazine. And one of the articles he wrote was about how slaves should be free. And Thomas Paine said it was inhumane and unethical for a person to own another person. And he was so appalled to know that many Philadelphians even owned slaves. The residents of Philadelphia were shocked to read his words, questioning the tradition of owning slaves. But we all now know that Thomas Paine was on the right side of this issue. And he, he was courageous to question this tradition. And he was one of the first persons to talk about this subject and to call for freedom and an end to slavery. He also wrote articles about women's rights, protecting the rights of animals and freedom of thought. Now shortly after Thomas Paine arrived to Pennsylvania uh, in 1775, there was a lot of talk about freedom from taxation and the rules of England. The King of England claimed that the American colonies belonged to him and the people who lived there were his servants to the empire. Now with the urging of Mr. Franklin, Thomas Paine wrote a book entitled Common Sense. In Common Sense, Thomas wrote that the colonies had a duty to fight for independence. And in the pamphlet, Thomas said a lot of things against the King of England and claimed that a king should not rule people living in America. And those words caused people in England to, talk, to call Thomas Paine a traitor. But in the colonies, Thomas was a hero. He joined the revolution by enlisting in the Continental Army and the Patriots commander in chief wanted Thomas to continue writing because his words were an inspiration to the suffering troops. And Thomas, he could write very well. The commander in chief of the Revolutionary War was none other than George Washington. And during the Revolutionary War, Mr. Thomas Paine volunteered to be the treasurer of the Second Continental Congress. And he also worked as a secretary and mail carrier during the Revolutionary War. 
He rode a horse every day delivering important papers, money, and his writings to the troop. His revolutionary writings are called the Crisis Papers. Thomas Paine wrote the Crisis Papers on top of a drum every single night, and his literary work was delivered as often as possible to George Washington and then distributed to the troops. Washington would read the Crisis Papers to the troops to motivate and inspire them. Now, I see a man, where's, where's Mike? There you are. Yeah, I want you to come up here, Mike. I'm gonna make you look like Thomas Paine as an adult. of what Thomas Paine wrote and was delivered to the troops. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny is not easily conquered, yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap we esteem too lightly. Tis dearness only that gives everything its value. Thank you, Mike. Kind of like in the hair thing. Yeah. <laughs> go, go sit down and enjoy yourself. <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> so after the war, Thomas Paine started designing iron bridges. He returned to England to build a bridge, but he also returned to continue to write. And this time, he wrote The Rights of Man, and that got him into a lot of trouble. The book encouraged people all over the world to declare their independence and to stop take, taking orders from kings and queens. Thomas wanted all the people in the world to be free. When the King of England read The Rights of Man, he ordered the arrest of Thomas Paine. The King's army dashed to the docks when it was discovered that Thomas was planning to leave England to escape arrest. And he escaped England by ship just minutes before the King's men caught up with him to arrest him. And this would have been yet another time where Thomas escaped death. People who were accused of treason were hung until dead. And that would have been Thomas Paine's fate had the king's army captured him that day. So Thomas went to France where he was greeted with a huge celebration because his book, The Rights of Man, was an inspiration to the people to start the French Revolution. Even though the French revolutionists honored Thomas's work, they became very angry with him when he said that there should be no executions during the French Revolution. And as you know, many people during the French Revolution were beheaded. There was so much killing going on that the French Revolution became known as the Reign of Terror. And this really upset Thomas as a new resident of France. And so he wrote newspaper articles about the horror of killing. And he was against the death penalty. And he said that those who were doing the killing were doing so inhumanely declaring that there were other ways to handle disagreements caused people in France to accuse Thomas Paine of being unpatriotic. Thomas argued that the French king helped the Americas uh, with the independence fight because they supplied money, weapons, ships, and troops. So naturally, Thomas Paine said, don't kill the king. Well, that fell to deaf ears. Suddenly, one day, Thomas Paine was arrested and thrown in jail. Every day for 10 months that he was in prison, Thomas Paine thought he would be taken to the guillotine at any moment for beheading. Now can you imagine living like that? 
Thomas Paine became very ill because of the conditions of the jail. They were just awful, dirty. The jail was smelly and there were rats crawling around everywhere. When prisoners were given food to eat, the food was rotten and moldy with worms crawling out of it. So Thomas lay dying in the jail cell because of lack of proper food and clean water. And one day, the jailer unlocked Thomas's cell to check on him. So the jailer unlocked the door, flipped it open, and the jail door was flat up against the wall, outward. And there was Thomas Paine laying on a heap of straw, too weak to move. Now to determine who was to be executed the next day, a giant X was placed on the door of the people who would be taken to the guillotine. The very next day that the door was accidentally left open, there was an X placed on Thomas Paine's door. But fortunately, overnight, the door was closed and the X was facing Thomas Paine. So the executioner did not see the X when he walked by Thomas Paine's cell. And that's what saved Thomas Paine from the guillotine. He was staring right at the X as the executioner led other people to the guillotine. He escaped death one more time. Now, during the time that Thomas was in jail, he became angry with his very close friend, George Washington. George Washington did absolutely nothing to get Thomas Paine out of jail, even though Tom, Tom Paine did so much to help George Washington win American independence. And you may be wondering why George Washington had abandoned Thomas Paine, because I'm sure none of you would do that to your friends, right? No. Well, the reason that George Washington would, get, would not get involved to free Thomas Paine from prison in France, it was all based on a religious matter. You see, just before Thomas Paine had been taken to jail, he wrote a new book called The Age of Reason. And he had slipped the text of the new book to his friend Joel, Joel Barlow. It was published right away because it was so brilliantly written. But the public was shocked by Thomas Paine's words in the Age of Reason. He condemned the teachings of religious leaders and he questioned their authority. And very few people ever questioned or criticized religion, but Thomas Paine was a courageous thinker. And George Washington, of course, heard about the book and he was afraid to show the world that he was a friend of Thomas Paine. He didn't want anyone to think that he agreed with Thomas Paine's religious matters. And that's why he'd left Thomas Paine to rot in jail. And he did nothing to help him. So no wonder Thomas was angry. Now finally, a nice man named James Monroe helped Thomas Paine get out of jail. Mr. Monroe would eventually become the fifth president of the United States. Thomas was released to Mr. Monroe, but he was very, very ill, and it took a long time to recover and for him to feel better. But when he was well enough to travel back to the United States, he was invited to stay with the third president of the United States. Thomas Jefferson and Tom Paine did a lot of work together during that stay. They planned things such as Social Security, the United Nations, the public school system, and foreign policy. And his framework is still used today in our government. Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson were great thinkers, but Thomas Paine was never paid for the services he gave to America during the Revolutionary War. But finally, in 1803, the government of the United States of America gave Thomas Paine a farm and a cottage in New Rochelle, New York. The Thomas Paine National Historical Museum is located there now, and you can actually visit the house where he lived. Well, Thomas Paine did not like living in New Rochelle, New York. During a local election, Thomas went to the polls to cast a vote. 
And the officials there in New Rochelle told Thomas that because he could not prove that he was an American citizen, he couldn't vote. And he tried to explain that he was a patriot, a founding father. He was friends with Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and many other influential people. Thomas said that he was English by birth, American by adoption, and French by decree. He also said, come on up here, Mike. The world is my country. To do good is my religion. And that's my favorite quote of Thomas Paine's. So even though Thomas Paine was absolutely correct, the officials wouldn't let him vote. But that wasn't the only thing awful that happened in New Rochelle, New York. One night, someone tried to shoot him as he was sitting at his desk that was located in front of a window. And the would-be assassin, his name was Christopher Derrick, missed the shot and Thomas Paine escaped death one more time. Now shortly after that incident, Thomas left New Rochelle, New York to live in New York City. He eventually died of old age in New York City. He was 73, that's quite old for that time period. It, that was 1809. You know, Thomas Paine lived much longer, would have lived much longer, had he not lost his good health in prison in France. He was always fighting bad health since that awful experience in jail. Now, Thomas Paine was buried in a simple grave on the grounds of his New Rochelle, New York farm. But there's a, one more story I want to tell you about Thomas Paine. During his lifetime, a British writer Mr. William Cobbett harassed, belittled, and attempted to bully Thomas Paine at every opportunity. And eight years after Thomas Paine's death, Mr. Cobbett started actually reading the works of Thomas Paine and started to feel awful about the way he treated him. So poor Mr. Cobbett, Cobbett was tortured he was tortured so much that he stood next to Thomas Paine's grave in New Rochelle for hours and hours and hours. Then one night, the town folks were shocked to discover that Mr. Cobbett had dug up Thomas Paine's coffin. And Mr. Cobbett took Thomas Paine's body to England, saying that he just wanted to give him a proper funeral to make up for the harassment he had shown against Thomas Paine. He said that he wanted to build a fancy memorial to honor Thomas Paine. But before any of that could be arranged, Mr. Cobbett died. And somehow, Thomas Paine's coffin and body are lost. And nobody knows where his bones are located. Now, because Thomas Paine's bones were lost in England and many English people still considered him a traitor to their country, some English parents taught their children this mean little rhyme. Poor Tom Paine, there he lies, nobody laughs and nobody cries where he's gone and how he fares nobody knows and nobody cares well i hope that you care about the legacy of thomas paine and remember how much he suffered in order to bring freedom and independence to people all around the world and there are monuments honoring the life of Thomas Paine. I'm going to tell you real briefly about them because someday you might be able to visit. There's a monument in Morristown, New Jersey, and this monument shows Thomas Paine writing on the top of a drum. And remember when I told you about him writing the crisis papers to help Washington rally the troops in order to win the Revolutionary War? Well, this monument is a re recreation of that time in Thomas Paine's life. And he's sitting there on a rock with a musket in his lap. He never raised a musket any other time but to work for America's independence. 
In Thetford, England, where Thomas Paine was born, there's a golden statue of him. He's holding a book in one hand and a quill pen in the other hand. And you can see this popular monument in uh, New Rochelle, New York. It's located to Thomas Paine's cottage, uh, right next to it. Um, and you can actually go to the cottage and see the bullet hole that resulted when uh, Derek, uh, Christopher Derrick tried to kill Thomas Paine. Uh, amazingly, in Paris, France, where Thomas Paine was once in prison, you'll find a huge golden statue of him on the grounds of the University of Science, and it's located in a beautiful park. If you go to Philadelphia, please stop by the uh, First National Bank on 3rd Street, midway between Chestnut and Walnut, and the portrait of Thomas Paine is there. And Few people know that Thomas Paine donated all the profits of his sales from the Common Sense pamphlet to start the first bank of the United States. And in today's world, that money would be equal to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now on 2nd Street in Philadelphia, you'll find a historical marker honoring Thomas Paine for the writing of Common Sense. And the marker is located to a little street, actually it's an alley, named after Thomas Paine. And there are many more Thomas Paine historical sites in Philadelphia that I would love to show you around um, the beautiful city that I live near. And the Free Thought Society tries to do something special every year to honor Thomas Paine on June 8th. That's the date that he died. Much better weather than the date he was born, <laughs> which is January. So um, I've been instrumental in getting that street named after Thomas Paine, getting the, the historical marker, and actually having the city declare June 8th as Thomas Paine Day. So thanks so much for listening to the life story of my hero, Thomas Paine, and I hope you will visit Thomas uh, Paine's place of residence, Philadelphia, um, New Rochelle, New York, uh, Bordentown, New Jersey, and learn more about Thomas Paine that I couldn't cover in the, the time that I had today. Do we have time for questions, Mike? Okay, but thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>